Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are very, very glad to welcome you here uh, this afternoon for this briefing on a very, very uh, newly released uh, analysis uh, by the Department of, of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, the, the study that is being released and was just posted today is called the Transportation Energy Futures Study. This is a very important topic because it has long been a major concern of national policy in terms of national energy security, national security issues for going back into the 70s that we really needed to look at transportation, we needed to look at our use of oil, and how we could reduce that amount of oil. Over the ensuing years, we have learned more and more about the threat of climate change and the need to also address greenhouse gas emissions in terms of carbon, and of course, petroleum is a very carbon-intensive fuel. So it has been a major concern of the Congress, of the public, for decades now to find better ways to look at these issues, how can they be addressed, uh, what makes sense in terms of technologies, fuels, uh, vehicles, etc. what are the ways to do that. So it is very exciting to have this new analysis uh, that it has just been released that is, uh, you're going to hear now about that in terms of the conclusions coming out of this study called Transportation Energy Futures. The study will identify a set of strategies that can achieve deep cuts in petroleum use and carbon emissions coming from the U.S. transportation sector. This gives us a chance to look at underexplored opportunities as well as the challenges along the path to a more sustainable transportation energy future. The study was done by the uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy, the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, NREL, as well as Argonne National Laboratory. We have a range of speakers today so that we will hear about perspectives of uh, policy officials from the Department of Energy as well as uh, the Department of Transportation, and then we will also have the findings presented by, um, uh, uh, by the senior analyst from the National Renewable Energy Lab. So I first want to turn to Michael Carr, who will be our first speaker, who Michael is the uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Mike? Let's see if it, thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks to everyone for uh, coming today, and thanks uh, to EESI for uh, kindly hosting us and quickly and, uh, in, and in a hurry. Um, I, I'm just going to take a, a couple minutes, really, just to frame a, a, a little bit of the context and just just talk a little bit about uh, where the administration. Uh, how, how much sort of weight we put on this as a as a goal going forward? Um, I think most of most of the folks in here, I think, know the the vital statistics about oil. Uh, it's an incredibly volatile resource. Uh, it it uh, as far as is price uh, that has dramatic impacts across the American economy. Uh, we spend uh, about a billion dollars a day importing. <laughs> uh, Importing oil, and uh, beyond that, sort of drain on the treasury and drain on taxpayers' wallets. Uh, we have, you know, every day we're we're subject to uh, potential price increases uh, due to world markets uh, that that can whipsaw uh, our our industries, our airline industry being a, a great example of one that, that has suffered greatly at the hands of, uh, of oil price spikes in the past. So, um, and so, you know, a couple of vital statistics. In 2011, we imported uh, 4.2 billion uh, barrels of oil for a price tag of about $467 million. 
36 uh, percent of all U.S. energy use is, is uh, from petroleum now, uh, and 70 percent of that of that petroleum goes into the transportation, and uh, 50 percent of our petroleum, give or take, uh, is is uh, imported. So, you know, given that that framework, uh, given that sort of set of circumstances, it's been uh, a policy both for Congress, but but in particular for the administration in recent years to diversify our, our sources of, uh, of a fuel for the transportation sector and uh, diversify the, you know, the opportunities for uh, individuals to move around the, the country. And so, um, you know, the, the historic CAFE standards are, are one example uh, of um, one of our recent efforts. And th this, this study, uh, in addition to our, um, our, our ongoing efforts in both biofuels and in, in, in electric vehicles, uh, electric drive vehicles of all kinds, including fuel cells, um, and in, uh, in, in other areas, in the other agencies, including you know, including in transit, um, this study helps to give us a little bit more of a frame for what the opportunity space is going to be in the in the future. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's a couple of really uh, interesting top lines that I think come out of this. Uh, you know, and the, the my biggest takeaway from it is there, you know, a combination of policies, a combination of technologies. Uh, I think present us with an unprecedented opportunity uh, to virtually uh, eliminate the uh, the impact of, of, of oil on our transportation sector over the long term, and that's that's something you really couldn't have said 20 years ago. Um, and so, you know, it, it'll take a range of things, uh, and and I think we'll talk about a few of those today. Um, but it's it's an exciting time to be working in in this field because. Uh, we really do have the opportunity to make a, make a difference in the in the relatively near term. So, with that, uh, why don't we get on to the substance of it, and then we can talk a little bit more later with some questions. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. And we'll now turn for uh, a perspective um, with regard to thinking about the the transport sector. We have with us today Arthur Rapinski, who is the energy economist uh, in the office of the Secretary of the Department of Transportation. Well, thank you for the uh, kind words, and I'll I'll see if I can uh, defer actually talking about substance for the uh, length of my presentation. I'd, I'd like to congratulate my uh, colleagues at the uh, at the Department of Energy for uh, for uh, all of their extraordinary work in bringing this uh, study to a uh, to a successful uh, conclusion. Uh, I can assure you that. Uh, um, doing thing doing projects like this is never easy. And uh, uh, behind every tiny little number on the uh, on the one page snapshot there are there are many, many hours of expert judgment and analysis and uh, quantitative modeling and uh, just plain uh, elbow grease. They should be very proud and I, I congratulate you um, from uh, from the uh, perspective of of our agency, I'd just like to leave you with our the at the Department of Transportation. Shut up. Um, the Department of Transportation. Uh, uh, we've of course participated with our colleagues at EPA in the uh, in the CO two tailpipe emission standards and cafe standards. Uh, uh, and but the uh, the primary method by which the uh, the uh, department uh, influences uh, the transportation system is through uh, transportation infrastructure. So of course we take a much more a very sort of infrastructure oriented uh, view. And uh, in that context, I'd like to suggest just just a couple of things. And the first is that the transportation system that if you're thinking in a, in a 50 year time frame. The transportation system exists basically to uh, serve the uh, the public and the economy, and that over that time period, uh, both the economy which it serves will transform itself in unexpected ways, 
and consequently the transportation system itself will go through a series of, uh, of changes, sometimes in unexpected ways. Um, if you think back, one of the extraordinary uh, inventions of the century just closed is the, uh, is the container, a, a no-tech steel box that, uh, that uh, really transformed freight in the, uh, in the world. Uh, 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 Fifty years ago, there were ocean liners, which then disappeared and suddenly reappeared as cruise ships. Uh, uh, possibly the greatest, a, 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 one of the uh, most important technological innovations in automobiles was actually the microprocessor, which has made possible all sorts of uh, uh, improvements in vehicles that probably wouldn't have been possible in 1970. So. I'm looking forward to as much of the next 50 years as I'll be able to uh, experience personally. <laughs> and I think, we, I think that, uh, that we will see yet more extraordinary changes in the, in the years to come. And uh, I think this report suggests some of the ways in which uh, the energy consumption of the transportation sector can be transformed. Thank you. Thank you. And I do. Th I quite agree that this is a very exciting time that we're really on the cusp of seeing enormous change, uh, because there are so many opportunities that are coming to the fore, and it is really incumbent upon us to think about things in a holistic way and in terms of a suite of actions in terms of technologies, new research, uh, whether we're dealing with with uh, vehicles, other kinds of infrastructure, fuels. Um, it's it's a very important, uh, uh, I think, approach to make sure that we always look at how things can fit together. Uh, it can be a very exciting kind of puzzle and that this study provides an opportunity to really provide uh, opportunities to think about these pathways forward and how we could put them together. And somebody who thinks about research and innovation a lot is Peter Chipman, who is the Senior Transportation Specialist with the Research and Innovative Technology Administration, which is part of the Department of Transportation. Peter. Great. I don't have to say the name of my agency again. It's a long one. Uh, and for those who know Art, he's more than likely going to outlive the next 50 years, so we'll see the conclusion of this. Uh, I just wanted to say that, well, when we read at, at DOT the Transportation Energy Future Study, we said, wow, we, we really need to get involved with that. And we recently signed an inter interagency agreement called this the Clean Transportation Sector Initiative that is sort of a next steps in, in, uh, to, to TEF to continue that good work and kind of look for in the areas that were recommended by the study for future research what, where we can get into that. And from the DOT's perspective, see where infrastructure can help leverage those fuel pathways and, and create efficiencies for those fuel pathways. Uh, and and uh, essentially help, as you were saying, Carol, uh, help uh, cover a well-rounded view of the sector over the long term. And I also want to say personally to Mike, uh, I know you already know this, but you have such a fantastic team, and we're just really honored to be able to have that crew working with us on the on the uh, CTSI. And and th thank you for their time. It's going to be a good product. And now we're to the real show in terms of uh, having a chance to really hear firsthand the conclusions, the findings coming out of this very, very important uh, study, the Energy Futures Study. And to present those findings is Austin Brown, who is Senior Analyst with NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. Do you want to Thank, thanks so much, Carol. I, I usually detest podiums or podia or whatever. So I, I don't like standing behind this, but I have a cheat sheet. Since this is so new, I can't get away with any sort of an excuse for memorization. So you'll have to, have to bear with me. I'm going to stand behind here, Mike, even though it's sort of against my, my better nature. Um, but I am really excited and a huge thanks to Carol and to EESI for, for hosting us here on really short notice, um, getting this together. And thanks to all of you for also spotting the invite and uh, taking your, your lunch hour to come down uh, and join us to talk about transportation. So I'm going to try to wing through um, in some sort of a hybrid of as quickly as possible because there's a lot to cover in a little time, but also with enough meat to hopefully give you a little bit of perspective on the study and what we looked at and really whet your appetites here. You just can't wait to go and download these, these 
these long, detailed reports and uh, do some, some, some quality time with them. Um, so uh, I think to start with, in the, the, the uh, key takeaways in transportation energy futures, which we heard a little bit about from Mike, is we have huge opportunities in transportation, key takeaway number one. But key takeaway number two is there's a lot of challenges to getting to where we believe that we can and need to get. Um, and that there really is a diverse approach needed if you want to have any chance of approaching the sorts of scenarios that we explored here. Um, I'll go through a brief outline of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to look through the approach that we took in the study, uh, along with the motivation behind the sorts of questions we asked, uh, the key findings that we came up with, and then the overall project summary conclusions. Um, the, the motivation here was to explore the options available uh, in order to make very deep cuts in petroleum emissions, in petroleum use, and in greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector. And when we say very deep cuts, we started out the study thinking of, of 80% as the sort of uh, realm that we would be exploring. There's a lot of targets out there. It wasn't going to be a formally binding goal for the study, but that was the, the framework that we were using to evaluate options. Um, to try to accomplish this, we took a collaborative approach. Uh, it's a project that was implemented by the uh, Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy along with Argonne National Lab and the National Renewable Energy Lab. And we drew on broad expertise wherever we could through academia, through our colleagues in the other agencies, uh, and through uh, others in the nonprofit and, and industry world to try to make us sure that we weren't going down a pathway that, that meant we were crazy. Right? We tried to use them to bring us back into line, keep us honest, really make sure we were looking at both key interesting questions, but also not going so far out on a limb that we were going to miss the mark and not provide useful analysis. Um, the outputs of the study are, are nine published technical reports that are coming out. They'll be on the, the project's website, as well as summary materials like this presentation, like the snapshot that should be available in the front, um, as well as some other uh, tools that we developed during the project that we thought might be useful for other analysis that will be made available on the project's website. Um, so I thought I would talk quickly about how we scoped and reviewed the project. Um, this is just a notional diagram. We started with the wide, wide world of transportation, really opening it up and saying we're not going to restrict ourselves to topics that we're already working on. We're going to try to look at any topic in transportation. That being said, we can't look at all the topics in transportation. So we used a process with a steering committee to help us narrow those possible topics down into areas of study and settled on nine individual topics that led to the project reports that we've published. Um, then from that, we synthesize those results into some summary materials like the, like the presentation I'll be, uh, I'll be going over today. Um, we we want to make sure that this is always in parallel to the ongoing analysis done by our colleagues at DOE, at DOT, and at EPA, and at other organizations. The goal of this project was, was entirely to be non-duplicative wherever possible. We didn't want to rehash the same questions that were hashed, but did want to take into account that important work that was also going on. So I'll start by talking through some of the modes that we looked at. Um, by modes, I mean how we get around. So this can be broken down into light-duty vehicles, which is passenger travel, like cars and light trucks, um, and non-light-duty vehicles, which ends up being a little bit of a mixing box for everything else, um, including things that we're very familiar with, like buses, trucks, and aircraft, and also some uses that tend not to get thought about very much, uses like uh, pipeline and, and, um, and marine and military uses. Um, so I'll start by covering um, some of the work that we did in the non-light-duty vehicle sector. Um, the non-light duty vehicle sector makes up almost half of transportation energy use today. And as I said, that tends to be, that's divided up into an almost astonishingly diverse collection of different sorts of vehicles and modes. And that makes it really challenging to get your hands around. Um, and that, coupled with the fact that light duty vehicles like cars and light trucks still are more than half of our energy use in transportation, has meant that Department of Energy and, and, and others have tended to focus a little bit more on the light duty vehicle sector. So one of the major uh, opportunities that we explored in this study was looking at these, uh, these potpourri modes in the non-light duty vehicle space to basically go out and say, we know there's a lot of efficiency potential in light duty vehicles that we're already working on. How much potential exists in these other modes? Um, so we can summarize those findings in a table. Uh, the top row of this table is the uh, vehicle energy efficiency improvements identified in each of these modes. And after the first one, these are the non-light duty vehicle modes that I mentioned. Um, so these are expressed as the potential percent reduction in energy use in these modes. And the first takeaway is that this efficiency potential is really very large. We're looking in many modes at the opportunity to save, through technology, more than half of the energy used per mile or per ton mile or per unit of service required. 
However, we have to place this into the context of the expected changes in uh, service demand for those modes. And while we have, uh, while we have the capability um, to make some predictions, uh, we, we see that there's a real potential for an extraordinary growth in these uh, non-light duty vehicle modes, far greater than the, than the potential growth in some cases that we see in the light duty vehicle space. That's due to an increase in, a projected increase largely in aviation um, and in international marine freight travel, um, but as well as a, an increase in domestic freight and these other modes as well. So while the good news here that we, is that we see a huge potential for energy efficiency in the non-light duty vehicle space, we almost need to capture that entire potential just to be able to break even with the increases in service demand. So then the third, uh, the third row is if we were to capture that whole efficiency potential but did experience those vehicle use demand increases, what the net change would be. And while they vary a little bit from mode to mode and obviously are far from certain, the take home message is that uh, without those efficiency potentials we would expect a really significant increase and with them we can basically uh, break even in the energy demand. So this is one first example that we see of a general principle in, in transportation that's identified by this study and by others, and that's that no single approach in the sector can get you to the sorts of deep cuts that we're talking about. We could look at this and say, oh, energy efficiency can't get you there, right? So rather than doing that, we then take efficiency in uh, as, a, as a piece of context to the larger sector. So next, um, I'll go over light duty vehicles. Uh, light duty vehicles were not a focus of the study, but we did need to use, uh, and, and the reason for that is that we have a lot of uh, ongoing analysis done by other agencies and by um, DO, DOE in other efforts, um, but we did need to include a light duty vehicle mix as context to understand the opportunities available. Um, I'll present briefly the mix that we, that we used as a sort of central case. Uh, this is certainly not prescriptive. It's not like we're saying this is exactly what the mix would be. It can just be viewed as one possible uh, low petroleum use uh, mix. This vehicle mix was developed with uh, Oak Ridge National Lab's MA3T model. It's a vehicle choice model that uh, competes vehicles against each other on the basis of, of total price perceived by the consumer. Um, we did run this case with uh, the optimistic uh, technical assumptions that come from uh, the Department of Energy's uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Analysis, looking at the research goals for those vehicles. So, and then we also uh, took into context that there would be an infrastructure available for those vehicles that required advanced infrastructure. I'll talk more about infrastructure later, but the takeaway from that is that this is a vehicle mix that could only be achieved with both meeting research goals for the technologies themselves, um, and by also in parallel deploying an infrastructure suitable to allow those vehicles to, to be operated by people. Uh, the vehicle types from starting from the bottom are conventional vehicle, diesel vehicles, a flex fuel vehicle, um, hybrid electric vehicles, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which are like the, the Chevy Volt available where you can um, get the energy from either electricity or from gasoline. Um, fully battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. And obviously, I, I can't state enough that this is just one example mix. We're not trying to pick uh, that this is exactly the mix that we'll go to. Um, but the good news is with this many potential uh, lower petroleum options, there is some flexibility if some of these technologies end up working and others are more challenging going forward. Um, so I said we didn't focus on light-duty vehicles. Um, we did, however, take a look at the, the, uh, the barriers that might provide prove a significant challenge to a deployment scenario like this one that we're giving here. Um, I've got a table summarizing those barriers. I don't have time to go through all of them today. Many of them are discussed pretty commonly in the literature. What we tried to do in the associated papers is provide some quantification and some prioritization. Which of these are really absolute showstoppers and which of these are barriers that the market might be able to, um, might, might be able to help deal with on its own. Um, by barriers, I mean uh, factors in the marketplace that aren't directly related to the technology that might provide uh, an, an inhibitor to deploying that technology. So one that's discussed a lot is uh, the range of the vehicle. So you could imagine a consumer not being as eager to buy a fully battery electric vehicle if they were concerned that that vehicle might not be able to meet their full range requirements on a daily basis for all the sorts of trips that they take. So we know then that there are ways to deal with these barriers. For example, you could make a, ba a longer range battery if you can make the, the technology good enough, or you could provide a very robust and dense infrastructure that allows people to have the faith that they'll be able to find a charging station anywhere. But, you know, in the interim, there are these barriers to deployment that we would have to overcome. One other factor that we looked at in addition to these non-cost barriers um, is trying to take the perspective of the manufacturers that would have to be buying into these advanced vehicle technologies. It's, it's fine and good to say that an individual and a consumer might have a, a 
an economic case to buy an uh, advanced vehicle due to the fuel savings available. But it's another question to say, will the auto companies see the value to themselves in selling those vehicles? Will they be able to look at that and say, do we think we can make a profit on that? So we have some analysis in the papers also looking at what you would need to do to figure out what that investment case is. Um, and this is, a real, I think, a missing gap in a lot of the analysis that's done here where we say, as soon as these vehicles are cost competitive, we think they'll get snapped up. You also have to have auto manufacturers interested in making these at scale, interested in building these in order to, to go out and make a profit selling them. That's when you'll really get to scale. So we investigated that as well. Um, next, I'll talk briefly about fuels. Um, fuels are where we get the energy to use in transportation. So if modes are how we get around, fuels are where the energy comes from. Um, it, it's no surprise uh, to this audience, I'm sure, that today we use mostly petroleum, as Mike mentioned. This is just a graphical breakdown of where those fuels come from. Uh, most of that energy comes from domestic oil, from imported oil, from other sources of petroleum, uh, like natural gas plant liquids. Um, there's some energy for natural gas that primarily goes into the pipeline infrastructure today, um, and some energy now in biomass for biofuels that's a potentially growing market share there. Um, in fuels, we looked at, first we looked at the potential to use biomass uh, in, in um, competitive markets. Uh, we developed a model that does a market equilibrium at various points in time, basically looking for what markets would be willing to pay to use biomass for various services. And the two that we explored in the most, the most detail are biomass for fuels, so biomass for either ethanol or for other liquid fuels that can compete directly with petroleum, uh, and bio, biomass for electric power, which would be another lower carbon use of biomass. Um, using that model, we found that in 2020 and in 2050, um, biofuels can be a competitive market for use of biomass um, and can displace uh, significant quantities of petroleum-based fuels, uh, even in, a, even in a, a market that doesn't have a price of carbon. Um, so this is looking, I should, I should emphasize, this is looking at a scenario where our research goals from Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy are met, um, the goals set up by the biomass program. Uh, and, and that includes both bringing the costs of conversion down, improving the logistics of gathering the biomass sustainably, and improving the conversion efficiency of those technologies. So this should be seen as, as the, um, at, by 2050 at least, of the upper bound of what we believe we can capture using sustainably produced biomass um, as calculated in the billion ton vision report, which is used as the basis for the supply here. Um, but we see if we do make those, um, make those accomplishments in the conversion efficiency and cost, uh, that by 2050, um, biofuels could provide a significant uh, portion of, of uh, each fuel market, jet fuel, diesel fuel, gasoline, and, and so-called bunker fuel, which is mostly used in marine applications. It's like a residual fuel. Um, I should also say that this, uh, this percentage is expressed against the baseline energy demand, so the projected energy demand if we didn't bring in additional efficiency. Uh, the percentage share of these fuels would go up if you also used efficiency and demand side approaches to reduce that energy demand. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I'll show what happens if you, if you mash up all of these different uh, parts of the scenario together. The other component of fuels that we investigated in some detail was the fuel infrastructure requirement for these scenarios. Um, and by, when I say infrastructure here, I'm referring to retail infrastructure, things like gas stations, the most common ones available today. But we know that advanced fuels, uh, such as the ones we've talked about for these vehicles, would require uh, additional novel infrastructure, such as uh, either hydrogen fueling stations, charging stations, both uh, personal and public, um, and potentially other, other things like uh, ethanol fueling stations as well. Um, so the first finding that we have is that the retail infrastructure um, is a very small portion of the overall fuel cost, relatively speaking. And that can be seen in the left graph. You can barely pick it out there. The green line along the bottom, um, along here, is the retail infrastructure cost uh, associated with really any of these scenarios, compared to the blue, which is the total reference fuel costs, uh, which, which go up as the projected petroleum price goes up. Uh, and the scenario fuel costs, which come down as we, as we use more efficient modes and use fewer fuels. Um, however, and then we expand those infrastructure costs out, there are significant replacement costs to go to these advanced infrastructures. It's just important to keep in mind the context that they're small compared to the overall fuel costs in the scenario. So in the business as usual, um, we're reporting that basically this is the replacement costs for infrastructure to do things like just doing gas station turnover and renovation and upkeep. Then we compare that to a variety of different um, scenarios that use different combinations of fuels and estimate the retail infrastructure that would be required to meet those, uh, fuel, those fuel demands 
um, at a national level. The portfolio case here is very similar to the one that I presented with the light duty vehicle mix earlier. And you can see we have to bring in a diversity of uh, sorts of fueling stations that would increase the total infrastructure cost, but um, by a level much smaller than what we would expect to get in fuel savings out of the scenario. However, this is just looking at the requirements. What this doesn't address yet, and what we will look at in, in, in parallel analysis, is the, uh, the challenges to deploying that infrastructure. We know that fuel infrastructure has a lot of uh, immediate barriers, so the classic chicken and egg question. Who's going to go out and, and, and pay to put in a bunch of uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure before there are customers uh, to, to use those stations? And then conversely, people are going to be more reluctant to buy electric vehicles until there's a reliable charging infrastructure that they can employ. So those issues are only dealt with uh, initially here, and those require some significant further, uh, some further explanation. Um, Lastly, I'm going to look briefly at, at the, uh, the approach we took to transportation demand. Um, this is a, sort of a newer uh, segment of the transportation system to us. What I mean by transportation demand are the factors that influence how people use the transportation system and how people get around. Um, in the United States, that's largely through personal vehicles, but other modes have key roles, in, in, including even walking, bicycling, and then obviously transit and other sorts of public transportation. Um, it's, it's new and very much capacity building for us. We usually, th we've historically thought in terms of technology impacts. We think it's very important to keep uh, each of these possibilities uh, in context with the whole transportation system. So for this portion of the study, we tried to examine the potential available for petroleum reduction um, in the, by, with demand side approaches. Um, I'm going to show a table of some of those potential impacts. We divide that up uh, into at least four, into four categories. It's, it's not always divided this way, and there's many perspectives on this. Um, the first one we looked at is called, we call built environment characteristics. This is how you choose to develop a city or how a city develops and how that impacts um, the demand for transportation. There's a lot of evidence in the literature that different, city, different approaches to, to how you build out a city can have very uh, significant impacts on the demand for transportation. Uh, we also looked at, at, within a built environment, what the potential is for trip reduction through other strategies. Example strategies would be um, teleworking or, or telecommuting uh, and, and a few other options to reduce VMT, uh, the, the need to drive in order to provide the same amount of transportation service. The third opportunity that we looked at uh, is, is also in sort of the personal behavior realm. We call this efficient driving. So that's uh, tools like driver feedback that have now been shown to have some good potential to improve uh, the ability of a driver to get higher miles per gallon without changing the technology that's actually doing the driving itself. Um, and we found there's some, there's some significant potential there. And the fourth opportunity we looked at is uh, what we call non-LDV mode switching. Um, this is the idea that you could potentially move freight through more efficient modes such as rail or marine uh, rather, than, rather than through trucks um, and then save money that way. There's a lot of challenges and a lot of um, issues that make it hard to do that that are explored in the papers, uh, but we do believe there may be some, some mode shifting potential there. Um, the, other, the other main conclusion besides the potential that's available, which does seem to be very significant, uh, is that any of these, if this is something that would want to be taking on, taken on uh, at, at, as, a, uh, as an option, would require deep partnership. So DOE and the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy uh, does a lot of research and development projects on these technologies. This is something that, if it was going to be pursued, would really require a concerted approach to thinking about this um, with, a, with many, many partners, both at the federal, state, and local levels, because so much of the transportation system is defined by those local authorities and by individual decision-making at different levels. Okay, so I've made sort of a whirlwind tour through each of these areas. Um, I hope I'm going to try and wrap this up quickly so that we'll have a little bit of time for questions so that we can explore any of those that have the most uh, interest to this group. But we did also, in addition to these uh, explorations of these topic areas, see what would happen if you take the impacts associated with each of these papers and each of these opportunities identified and put them all into one framework to see what sort of combined input you could have. I want to emphasize that what we did not do is macroeconomic modeling to try to estimate the impact that this would have, um, the combined impact this would have on, for example, oil price. You could imagine a lot of macroeconomic factors uh, feeding back into the system and making this challenging. So what this is not is a scenario, or is not a projection uh, or a representation of goals, but it is an assessment of the potential impact if you did pursue each of these individual opportunities and achieve them at the same time. 
So starting from the left is the base case. Uh, this is the amount of energy, the amount of uh, petroleum energy specifically, that we would expect to use uh, by 2050 uh, in the reference case if no changes are made to that case. Um, and it's around 25 quadrillion BTU. Significantly, that's about the same as it is today. Um, this is actually something that we should see as major progress. Uh, if you look back just a few years, the projections out, if you took the projections out to 2050, um, they would be very significantly higher than this. Um, the specific projection that we use here is uh, an extrapolated version of the uh, Energy Information Administration's annual energy outlook. So that only at this time went to 2035. We extrapolate that out to 2050. So it's just kind of a straight line approach where we might get. I've divided that base case energy use into light duty vehicles and non light duty vehicles. And if you've got really good eyes, you can see that, that the non light duty vehicle is now a bigger share of that of that total use than it is today, mostly because we're able to address the light duty vehicles with CAFE standards that are already in the reference case. The second column is uh, the size of the potential opportunities identified in each of these research areas that I just covered very, very quickly. Um, starting from the top, it's uh, the non-light duty vehicle efficiency potential identified, light duty vehicle efficiency and drivetrain electrification, which we show is sort of a blended opportunity in between modes and also fuels because it involves both more efficient use of energy and a shift to alternative fuels. Um, a significant potential from biofuels to displace some of that remaining petroleum. And then at the bottom, some of the impacts of these demand side efforts, including the non-light duty vehicle mode switching, um, VMT reduction, and, and the uh, driver feedback that I mentioned. Um, because some of these opportunities actually interact with each other directly, that is if we reduce a mile of travel but also make the vehicle more efficient, we can't count those opportunities twice. Um, so we add back a little bit of a term for that overlap to make sure we're not doing any double counting. But even after we do that, we find that the combined potential identified in each of these opportunities uh, is, is somewhat greater than the total petroleum use in 2050. Um, so from this, we could conclude that the potentials do exist to completely displace petroleum use from the transportation sector. We can also put this in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, and here I've turned it into a time plot. I want to caution you not to take this as a, very, as a literal time scale for trans transitions, just to illustrate the sorts of annual changes that would be needed to get to this scenario. Um, but again, we see that the combination of use intensity or demand side measures, energy intensity or energy efficiency measures, and low carbon fuels uh, has the potential to very significantly uh, reduce the GHG emissions from the transportation sector. Um, I'll go over the key takeaways one more time. Uh, I think now you can maybe see why I think that they're at least a plausible interpretation of this report. Uh, the first one was that we have really key opportunities in transportation to reduce petroleum use and GHG emissions. But then the second one is that in order to get to a scenario like this, that's very, very aggressive and optimistic, would require addressing huge challenges in a very concerted um, and dedicated way. Uh, so with that, I will just put this up for more information, uh, who to contact if you have questions, and where to go to find the detailed reports and summary material. Um, and I think hopefully we can leave some time for questions. Great. Thank you very much, Austin. And I want to also, um, at this time, thank Senator Murphy's office, um, who made it possible for us to actually hold the briefing today. Um, uh, because that's really critical to have that kind of cooperation so that we can find rooms so that we can help bring good, solid information to, um, to all of us. And so we want to thank them very, very much for their um, great help and coordination. Uh, let's open it up for your questions and comments now, because as we've seen, there is enormous potential in terms of efficiency improvements, changes in technologies, um, looking at fuels. But again, I think um, what I was also struck by was how these things all have to kind of work in tandem, how we have to look at a whole range of things and be clear about that and understand where the challenges are so that as for people who are our policymakers or uh, folks at state and local uh, government levels, uh, private sector, that it means really seeing, having a vision, seeing how these things need to work together, how um, infrastructure challenges can be overcome so that things can move together in tandem. And if one does that, there is incredible potential if we, if we really um, uh, look at this analysis very seriously. So let's, who has the first question? Okay, and if you could identify yourself, please. 
Uh, I'm Julia Piper with um, uh, E&E News uh, Climate Wire. Um, I wondered if anyone on the panel could say how this ties into the EPA report that was released today on light duty vehicles, just sort of how these kind of complement each other, but then also maybe more importantly get into some of the details of the heavy duty vehicles. What are the opportunities? Which sector do you think is going to see improvements versus marine, aviation? They've all been pursuing biofuels in various degrees. So what are really the opportunities here? Uh, can you get into some details on that? Thanks. I mean, I don't think I don't think any of us can speak for for EPA and how they see it. I think that there's um, really a lot of parallels that are emerging in the analysis field in general. That a lot of the studies of this are coming to surprisingly many of the same conclusions about the opportunities that are out there. The exact amounts will vary, um, of course, but I, I can't speak to that individually. Um, on the on the modes issue, uh, from an analytic perspective. The, one of the key challenges in the non-light duty vehicle sector is just how long those vehicles are used for. Um, you especially see this in aircraft and, and large ships where that's just an enormous capital investment. Uh, you also see this in, in heavy trucks where trucks are on the road for a very long time. But the good news in trucks, and actually to a lesser extent in each of these modes, is that the newest vehicles are used a disproportionately large amount of the time. So for example, for a truck, uh, a heavy truck, a Class 8, like what you think of as a tractor trailer, the big trucks. Uh, the first couple of years, they drive something like 100,000 miles a year. Really, really just pound these new trucks into the ground. Basically, they get the newest, best, most efficient truck, and then they can use it. And for those years, the fuel costs are the vast majority of their expenses, or, or for, uh, compared to the capital, the drivers are expensive too, but the... Um, Fuel costs are really their, one of their biggest expenses. Then after the first couple of years, those trucks tend to be sort of semi-retired into more local delivery. They become like the Safeway trucks that you see doing, doing local delivery stuff on routes. Um, so the good news there is that you can actually get the uh, efficient vehicles in and see a disproportionate impact. You don't have to wait for the full fleet turnover. Um, I don't know if that, if that helps, but so, so trucks seem to have that the most, but that's sort of some good news in each of those, even though the challenge is that those technologies are really uh, long-lived. There. Any other comments with regard to the question? Anybody else? Okay. Um, back here. Hi, I'm Max Barnes with Toyota. Uh, I had a question about um, how the modeling was done. Um, I imagine that there's some kind of like endogenous technological improvement or you know cost um, reduction in there. Are those? Um, uh, is that linked to any specific technologies that you're hoping to see? Is there something that you're saying, you know, we're relying on this kind of drivetrain or battery cost to come down? I don't know, you know, I imagine a lot of that is fleshed out further in the report, but I was wondering if you had anything to say on that. Sure. So, so each of the, every mo piece of modeling in this activity was done in the individual reports, and then the, the synthesis is a, is a simple spreadsheet tool that we can also make available. Uh, it sounds like you're asking about the non -light, the, uh, sorry, the light duty vehicles specifically and what technologies are involved. So there we work very closely with the analysts in the Vehicle Technologies Office and the Fuel Cells Technologies Office in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, they work, they work uh, with their um, grantees to develop cost targets that they have uh, going forward for what those vehicles could cost. That's things like the battery cost, things like the, drive, the electric drivetrain's cost and characteristics, how much a fuel cell would cost, how much hydrogen storage would cost, and what it would cost cost to produce hydrogen, and we use those technology targets, which are based on their engineering analysis, as the basis for that cost, for the, that cost modeling. Um, you know, we don't, it, it, you then assume that there's price premium paid on the vehicle so that there's profit margins as well. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Do you link that to any of the stuff um, that, you know, maybe something from RPE or something like that, or is it linked mainly to what's going on um, with it, you know, the area of EER? You know, uh, so we work with the the projects from RPE, but usually those are more, you know, those are more of a reach project. And so the goal would be w once those bear fruit and, and are then sort of passed along to more uh, development kind of research, those would then enter in. So far, it's assumptions that are based on those programs targets, uh, quantitative targets. So you could say from that, there might be, you know, potential for breakthroughs to, to change the game and actually provide more upside. But we don't assume those in this, in this study. Um, and if you want the, the specific model used to go from component cost to vehicle cost, is called autonomy. It's an Argonne National Lab model. Um, you basically say, here's what the components of the vehicle are, and then it tells you here's what the car looks like in terms of how much it might cost. Um, and that's developed with a lot of collaboration with the automakers as well. Um, I, and, and just to, to expand on that, 
slightly because um, I think this actually relates back to a little bit to the last question. Um, the 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 program, the individual programs within EERE uh, do an extensive amount of modeling uh, of of the technology, the various technology pathways. Some of which are not even within their portfolio. I mean, they have to understand the marketplace and that that they're they're trying to. Uh, push these technologies into. And so, um, you know, I think largely the answer to the question of, you know, where do we see the next modes uh, or, or the next biggest opportunities in, in time is going to be answered on a very specific level within within the programs. And you can pretty much see it, right, you know, the, where, where our area of research emphasis shifts from year to year. Um, so this is this is a good opportunity to kind of take a step back from that and say, okay, so what is the what is the larger opportunity space, um, and for you know, and a part of that is making sure that we <laughs> that we're looking at all of it, um, but but also you know to be able to say, you know, when you aggregate all these things up, things things break our way, <laughs> uh, you know, on the technologies. What does this all add up to? And it adds up to you know a really substantial uh, uh, effect. Okay, question here first. Um, okay. Thank you. Hi, Brian Scretney with the American Clean Skies Foundation. Um, with regard to your conclusions for um, displacing petroleum use, I see you make a lot of gains in various areas from LDV and HDV efficiency to electrification to biofuels. What I don't see here, though, is an increased use of natural gas as a transportation fuel. Um, and with the recent shale gas boom, you know, we've seen a significant increase in CNG and LNG use, especially in the heavy-duty trucking sector. I'm wondering how much that played into your calculations here and, uh, you know, and why we don't see more of it in your ultimate results. There we go. Sure. So, I mean, we did look at it a little bit on the infrastructure side when we were examining how these different infrastructures would be required uh, to, to provide different sorts of fuel. Um, it wasn't a, a, a major component of the outputs, in part because there's a lot of parallel work going on with, for the role of natural gas in transportation, um, and we were trying to, to address things that were that were not already being studied in that regard. Um, I would say mostly. We do, I mean, there is, you know, a huge amount of interest in our vehicles technologies office in natural gas for trucks, especially the business case there looks looks really great. So I, right. I agree. And, and there are, and I guess, you know, there there are research tasks uh, on on natural gas in the in the transportation sector within, within EERE and, and in other places. Um, I think the, you know, what, what you see here too, though, is, you know, if you, you notice the total, Exceeds the demand in in that in that last chart, and so uh, that that's one scenario. And there are a lot of ways that that this could play out in, on an individual uh, basis. Um, I think a, a, a lot of what you're seeing in natural gas is happening, like like you mentioned today, and is in you know the commercial markets are already are pulling in you know in pretty strongly in in a, in a certain direction there, and so. Um, you know, I think you know it, it, it's it's part of the, the you know the range of things of, of outcomes that that we for, foresee, um, but you know there there are a lot of things that need to be done in a lot of different contexts. So you know it, it's I, I don't think it substantially uh, or uh, really affects where what how we see the the world. You know that we see that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity. I think you're pointing to to one that that we certainly uh, agree is there. And, and just, I mean, in the spirit of the findings that, that the cha one of the challenges with petroleum is that it's the only fuel source right, for transportation, essentially. And you run into problems when you have total dependency on one thing. And diversity of supply, like we have in the electric sector, is, it can provide some, some price stability, can provide some other benefits and some hedging. So you know, one of the conclusions is diversity in options is, is available. And so I think that's just in keeping with that. Yeah, and as I recall on one of the slides, you really did look at that there were um, sort of a host of, 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 of options there, and the whole point being that it's hard to say which, which ones will have how, what sort of percentage ultimately. 
but that it could be any combination thereof, and, and certainly natural gas was an important one of those on that slide. Uh, let's go, um, there was a hand back here, over here first, and then back over here. And I should also just mention, too, that I believe there are nine reports, you said, that we will, um, on EESI's website, uh, in conjunction with the briefing, we will go ahead and put a link to, to those papers so that you can totally get into the weeds in terms of looking at um, this analysis. Because I think, you know, we'll all learn by looking at this ever more deeply. Okay? Hi, I'm Allison with the Energy and Commerce Committee, and um, I was hoping you could just talk a little bit more about what you're including in biomass and what your assumptions are about what types of biomass would be in the fuel supply. And then also, when you were looking at the greenhouse gas emissions reductions, what were your assumptions? Was it just focused on the combustion, or would you look at the life cycle of the biofuels that were being used? That's a great question. So the, I'll direct you to the biomass paper, which is available on the website for, for a better answer than this. But the short answer is uh, all of the biomass that we know how to describe. So it's all the different types in the billion ton vision study. And then we also paired that up with all of the conversion technologies that we have uh, that we have good engineering analysis on. So that's so the supplies, it's things like forest residue, dedicated en um, uh, energy crops like uh, uh, like um, switchgrass, uh, crop residue that can be done without, without uh, this study looks at, the Billion Ton Vision study looks at crop residue that you can do without interfering with the crop itself, um, and, and a variety of other kinds of, of available biomass. The conversion technologies are things like, um, we do like biochemical ethanol, like what's done today, but also pyrolysis, um, gasification, uh, and, and even algal, uh, algal biomass is a, is a technology explored. So the model basically looks at all of the available resources, all of the available conversion technologies, and then these different markets for actual fuels, um, gasoline, diesel, uh, jet, and... Um, and bunker. In terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, we did look at the life cycle emissions associated with those. Those estimates come from the GREET model, which is an Argonne National Lab model that is constantly being updated with the best uh, understanding of what those life cycle emissions are. Uh, most of these advanced technologies are expected to have lower GHG emissions um, than than what's in the uh, than what's in the, the, the biofuels markets today. Um, and I should also say it's a slightly modified GREET run uh, we did to not take a credit for the electricity produced, a, a CO2 credit. So this is only for the fuels themselves. But we only are looking at CO2 here. So there, are, there is a, some emissions associated with uh, non-CO2 emissions that aren't included here. Okay. Uh, back here first and then. Great. Um, first, I'm John Davies with the Federal Highway Administration. I'd like to commend you for the remarkable um, uh, breadth of this study. It's, 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 I mean, it really is a, a pretty amazing uh, body of work. And I'd like to ask you a little bit more uh, to uh, sort of uh, talk a little bit more about the, the, the cost dimension of, of your analysis, especially uh, with respect to, um, I guess, uh, presumed you know, thresholds at which uh, point various, you know, alternative energy sources, vehicle technologies, and um, sort of uh, uh, travel modes would become uh, cost competitive. Did you have a sort of a, a presumed uh, carbon cost or level of public support that was associated with the, 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 the I guess, sort of the levels of, uh, of, of reduction that you were, uh, that you were uh, uh, projecting in this analysis? So, so due to the nature of exploring potential, we didn't want to get at the study level too deeply into trying to look at the impacts of an economy-wide carbon cost. Some of the papers, like the, the biomass paper, do explore what impact carbon cost might have on that individual market, but we, didn't we don't have, for example, one macroeconomic model that applies that CO2 cost to all the sectors. So each of the individual sectors seeks with the best tools, of it, or each of the individual reports tries with the best tools available to do an intelligent job of estimating the cost effectiveness of those strategies. But the amount of tools we have available to do that in these different sectors varies. So like when we're looking at light duty vehicles, we do a, a cost competition model uh, to try to estimate what a consumer might be interested in buying. But there's so many open questions out there about how, the, how well those models work, we're not sure, right? So there it's just best described as a potential. It's something that, that could happen if we get those to be cost effective, uh, consumers might buy them. But it doesn't go in and, and you know, we don't, necessarily have 
I think we have the behavioral question solved of what, what are people looking for in vehicles and how willing are they going to be to go adopt those. So I would say we don't have, and what we, what we didn't try to include in scope was what's the economy-wide cost and benefit of, of this sort of a scenario. Um, we did not feel like we had the cross-sector analytic tools to be able to do that. But we did try to, to keep cost in mind with the best analytic abilities that we could in each of these individual issue papers. Okay, here first and then in the back. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent did you look at some of the research being done in EERE for higher efficiency, such as uh, improved engines or thermoelectrics? So the, each of those technologies should be directly uh, represented in these, uh, especially in the light duty vehicle and non light duty vehicle modes. Um, the uh, EERE has a great project called Super Truck, which is looking at efficiency potential in, in trucks, and it's very compatible with the analysis here. Um, you know, we, we work very closely with them on this study. So yeah, those are, those are absolutely included as potential, potential technologies in here. Okay, great. Um, back here. Okay. As you say, you pretty significant upside opportunity in the biofuel side. Which pretty good fuel diversity. The, the current uh, infrastructure has been relatively hostile to biofuels. Did you do any work on what the infrastructure aspect of getting to those kinds of levels might look like? So, so in the outputs that we saw from this, the most of the fuels that are produced once you get to these advanced technologies being fully mature are actually petroleum compatible. So the, a lot of the, you can produce fuels out of things like pyrolysis oil and gasification that are directly compatible with the, with the wide scale distribution infrastructure um, rather than ethanol, which can be a challenge. Um, so it wasn't something that we had to explore in a huge amount of detail. With the retail infrastructure, we did look at how much, if you did go to E85, how much on the retail side you would have. But that still doesn't address the, some of these intermediate infrastructures. So are you going to go to rail tanking? Are you going to build dedicated ethanol pipelines? Are you going to go to compatible infrastructure? Um, the, bio, the Office of Biomass of Bioenergy Programs uh, in Yeri does look at a lot of that stuff. Though. Okay. Uh, was there a question back there? Um, you've talked a lot about um, efficiency within a mode and of different fuels. And I'm wondering if, it's another scope question, I guess, if you've looked at the opportunities for infrastructure uh, investment to s enable switching modes that are more uh, efficient with energy at least. Yeah, there's, there's a paper looking at that in the freight sector specifically. So it, we call it the, the non-LDV mode switching. Um, it looks at what the different influencing factors are for why freight is moved the way that it is today uh, and, and might be in the future, and then some potential options that might, might tilt that balance. Um, th there's a lot of questions about, you know, you could do additional infrastructure in ports or in rail um, and different, different modes to do that. Uh, there is, we, we believe there's some potential there, but there are also really big challenges to that. Uh, right now, the freight system is very much defined up based on the characteristics and the geography of what you're trying to move. Um, so you, you find that it really depends on how far you're going, if there's an existing rail line that goes there. Um, if it's, basically, if it can be done by rail today, it is, because rail is so much cheaper per ton mile than, other, than, than, than truck freight. Um, and so there's real challenges to developing that infrastructure. But we did outline some of the opportunities there. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead, Bill. Uh, Bill Umber with, the, with ACOR. In order to reach the efficiencies you're looking at in light duty vehicles, where are you going to get the octane? So the octane? The octane. You mean in the fuels themselves? In the fuels themselves. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no combustion engine expert. Uh, m most of the vehicles, in, at least in the out years, are uh, not relying on internal combustion engine vehicles. Do you mean do you mean for like turbocharging, where you have to go to you can go to higher octane fuels? No, I see engines. Uh huh. Internal combustion engines. So I so we didn't look in detail at the technologies in ICEs, um, mainly because the analysis that EPA and DOT do for part of their cafe goes sort of option by option through each of those available technologies. Um, so that wasn't something that we pursued in a lot of detail. Do you, do you have more, do you, 
Do you mind elaborating on your question? Well, we're going to have IC engines for some time. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to need a higher octane fuel in order to function effectively at the higher compression ratios, turbocharge, it's that direct injection. Mm -hmm. So where's the octane coming from? That's not something that I had thought of as a challenge. Um, do you well, have I guess I would just point out that, uh, again, this relies, this study relies on the individual technology pathways that, that are identified in the individual programs of, of EERE. So the Vehicle Technologies Program has been looking at uh, high, uh, high compression ratio uh, engines, for example, uh, and, and they, you know, have mapped out those demands. Uh, and uh, the biofuels program, as another example, has been, you know, has pretty significantly transitioned in, you know, recent years into looking at the drop-in fuels. Uh, and, and they work, again, closely with <laughs> the vehicle technologies program to, so that they have good visibility on what, what engines are coming down the line. So you know those those cost curves, those those sort of technology scenarios are inherent to the research efforts that are going on in EERE, and then they just by by their nature are, are built into this this larger modeling exercise. So I mean I think that's a little bit of the answer to the sort of the the earlier uh, biofuels question as well. You know you know we are always trying to track where the markets want to pull anyway, and, and then we're trying to fit our, our various technology, uh, to our technology pathways into those markets. But in the um, octane issue area, brother, um, EPA basically controls that. Well, it, it, I mean, I think if you're talking about sort of the narrower question of blend wall and, and those, those very specific questions, I mean, it's worth... There's a couple things. One thing it's worth keeping in mind: this is a scenario that projects out fairly far into the future, and so a lot of these, uh, you know, sort of the early market hurdles um, are are you know sort of show up as blips on a larger on a larger trajectory, and you know they're they're significant. That doesn't minimize that they're real actual market barriers, but the but the technology when you look at technology potentials, you're sort of assuming that. That uh, you know, policy factors are taken into account, and then you do you overcome them eventually, um, and so you know that's why you end up with this sort of broad sweep uh, in the, in the projection. Um, I th again, you know, if you look at sort of if you want to really sort of dig down into the biomass program and what they're looking at technologically, they are looking at. A lot of different pathways, a lot of different technology pathways to achieving higher octane ratings, to achieving drop-in fuels, to the to the exact fuels that are being demanded by the market. I think we would tend to agree that the internal combustion engine marketplace is moving in that direction towards those higher octane numbers, and you know, and so we have to take that into account on, on our technology pathways, and that's what we're doing. Okay, um, good. Thank you. It's. I think that's true with regard to a number of these issues that that it really is going to take looking at a lot of the underlying analysis, um, uh, trying to have a better understanding, uh, literally, as I said earlier, getting down into the weeds so that we can really look at how these things really do fit together, where there are questions, how do we solve uh, some of the issues that come up. Uh, but the exciting thing is that there are a variety of options. Um, and and different pathways that can be put together creatively. And this is, um, I, I think, a very, very important step in terms of helping all of us who are concerned about policy and looking at trends to know that there are a variety of options and we need to figure out now how to just go ahead and put them together because the opportunities and the innovation is clearly, clearly there. So I want to thank you all very, very much for coming. And the uh, there will be a, a video and a link to the underlying uh, papers on EESI's website. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us um, or the speakers directly. Thank you so much for coming.